spend some time. Listen, today we start in the book of Acts. Like I said, if you have been here um, for the last uh, few weeks or months, we have been delving into God's Word in the Gospel of Mark, one of those four, first four books of the New Testament. Today we start into the fifth book of the New Testament called the Acts, or as if you've got a hard copy, the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. And what a great place to start then at the very beginning, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If you've got a Bible, uh, read along. Uh, I'm reading out of a version called the New Revised Standard Version, the NRSV. If your version's different, that's okay. But we're not going to read it all in one chunk. 14 verses is a lot to kind of uh, chew on all at one time. I don't want you to zone out right away. So we're going to break it up into chunks. We'll start with verses 1 through 3. And... Uh, Katie, it's Theophilus. Um, in the, my first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So what do we know about the book of Acts? We know that the book of Acts is actually what we would call Luke part 2. Those of you that know the gospel of Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Luke is one of our four gospels. Uh, the book of Luke is based off of the book of Mark. Uh, this author, Luke, who the New Testament tells us is a physician, used Mark as a template for his version as we know, the letters of the New Testament, I'm sorry, the books in the New Testament are actually letters. They're often written to people. So the book of Luke is written to this guy whose name is Theophilus. And it tells us in this beginning of Acts that he has sent the, the gospel of Luke as a letter to Theophilus. And now he's kind of following it up with this, well, here's what, to catch you up on the story, here's what's happened since Jesus has been resurrected and ascended. And the book of Acts kind of tells this story from Jesus' ascension on. And what this infant church looks like. And the amazing things, the amazing acts that Jesus' followers do uh, in these first few years of the early church. And he gives us that great outline saying, you know, we've read what Jesus did. Uh, we know that he died and was resurrected and uh, is ascended. Um, so he's a great author. He's making the connection between the two books. Picking up in verse 4, it says this, While staying with them, Jesus ordered the disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he says, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is the time, this the time when you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. It might have looked like this. Who knows, it's kind of, this is one of those stories that's kind of hard to imagine what it was really like. I know there was a movie that just came out not that long ago called Risen, and in that, Jesus kind of like disappears into the sunlight, which I think is a great uh, way of envisioning it. Um, I don't know if it was like Jesus' rocket ship kind of thing. I, you know, who knows? But the fact of the matter is that Jesus, we call this Ascension Day. Forty days after the resurrection, uh, Jesus has spent time with his disciples, has broken bread with them, has continued to teach them, and here he is heading off into the clouds. To help us visualize a little bit better, here's a picture of where Jesus, from what Scripture tells us, where Jesus actually ascended. 
This is called the Mount of Olives or Mount Olivet. It sits just to the east of Old Jerusalem. Um, it's a, a, a mountain that we hear about throughout the Gospels because Jesus, this is like his place. This is where he goes. On the eastern side of it is the, the village of Bethany where his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. Where just a few weeks before, uh, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. On the western side of it, we just heard a story from the western side where it sits the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus, a couple of days before he is resurrected, he's betrayed in the garden there by his friend Judas. Uh, Jesus uh, takes his disciples there. This is where he goes to like pray and to be. Maybe you've got a place like Mount Olivet that you just go and find solace and comfort and rest for your soul. This was Jesus' place. And it's hard not to, for those of us that have climbed mountains before, have seen these uh, incredible views from the top of a mountain, it's hard not to want to be in a place like that to think and to pray, right? You're often stunned by the, the sight of the top of a mountain. So this is where Jesus uh, made his last post-resurrection appearance to his disciples and goes to heaven to be at the right hand of God. Picking up from there, scripture tells us, while he was going and the disciples were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. So as you know, I don't preach, but every six or eight weeks or so, I often have plenty of time to look ahead to uh, see what the scripture is going to be and to kind of chew on it for a few weeks. I have to tell you, I don't particularly like this text. I don't like this story from the beginning of Acts. I've dreaded kind of preparing for it because when I read it, I am not energized by it. And I think this is why. When I look at this text today, I, I, I want to see a, a resurrection story instead. One of these moments like the road to Emmaus where on the Easter evening, Jesus is walking with two men and he kind of opens their hearts to his kingdom and to himself, and that he's re revealed to them in the breaking of the bread. I love that post-resurrection story. I love the post-resurrection story of, of Thomas, and saying, you know what, unless I can put my fingers in his wounds, in his side, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus says, here I am, do it. Stop doubting. I love that story. I love the story where uh, the disciples are fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and they come ashore, and he's got fish waiting and he and Peter have an interaction. I love those stories. Maybe it's because, because I was raised in the church. I'm used to those stories after Easter. For those of us that were raised in the church and used to a set of readings where we get quite a few weeks of Easter stories, it seems like it's a hole this week. I mean, we're still Easter season. The lilies smell as fragrant as ever. We still got the banners up. We're singing My Redeemer Lives. Um, we want those Easter stories. Instead, what we get today is, yes, an Easter story, a post-resurrection story, but one, when I read it, I see absence. I see, in some ways, personal disappointment, and here's why. Jesus spends 40 days on earth after Easter, and on that Thursday, he's raised to heaven and I keep thinking, I wonder why Jesus or why God chose 40 days for Jesus to remain on earth. Why couldn't it have been longer? 
Why couldn't it have been 80 days and that many more people would have seen him? Scripture says, you know, it's probably a few hundred, if not a couple thousand people saw Jesus post-resurrection. It's not like word hadn't got out because word had. But why couldn't it have been a longer period of time, Jesus being on earth? Why couldn't it have been a couple of years or 40 years or... You know, part of that longing in my heart says, why couldn't Jesus still walk among us today? I see when I read this text an absence, maybe uh, this, what could have been had Jesus stayed instead of what we're given? What could have been? It reminds me of when I started uh, my first job, my first real job. I'm sure you know that first real job. Uh, it was just after September 11th in, in 2001. Uh, I had accepted a call to be a youth director at a church in, outside of Boise, Idaho. And I remember loading up the U-Haul. My dad and I drove out. We put the car in a trailer, drove out. Uh, from greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky to Idaho it is a long trip by U-Haul, I'll tell you that. And so I, I, was, uh, I think the excitement grew as I got closer and closer and I found an apartment, got the stuff moved in, and then there was that moment where it's like, my dad's like, it's time to take me to the airport. It's time for me to go back. And that sense of dread that set in when I realized I was about to be alone. And I remember dropping him off at the airport. He's the kind of guy, he's like, I'll oh, just, just pull up to the curb and drop me off. Um, and that's what I did, and I was like hoping to be able to go in with him, but he's like, oh no, just drop me off. Um, and this fear set in, and like tears were welling up in my eyes as I'm dropping him off, thinking, I'm alone. I'm off on my own. There's no one really to catch me this far away. Now, the Gospel of Luke says at the ascension that Jesus' disciples were joyed at seeing it and were joyed going back to Jerusalem. Uh, to be honest, I can't resonate with that. I feel this sense of dread and fear of not having Jesus present anymore. That same fear that we felt on Good Friday, not knowing two days later Jesus was coming back. That was a short amount of time. This they knew was the end of Jesus' time on earth. And for me, I keep thinking like David the Apostle would have been really worried and fearful and scared out of his mind as to what life was going to be like without Jesus walking beside him. I see this as a story of absence. A story of absence. And as I think about this, I've, I've wrestled with this question, is it okay to sense God's presence and absence at the same time? Is it okay to feel the Spirit moving in my life, but also there to be a longing in my life for Jesus to walk beside me in my discipleship? Am I living out my faith? How do I wrestle with this, this paradox, this, this way of being that I can't wrap my mind around of God being fully present in the Spirit, but also um, knowing that it's not quite the fullness that we'll get when we see Jesus face to face in heaven. Listen, I think that we have our moments of knowing God's presence, right? At least I hope that we do. I know as I, I looked at this text, I started thinking about when is it I felt God moving in my life? When is it I felt God truly present in my life? I think about uh, my first ELCA National Youth Gathering in Atlanta in like 93 or 94, and how incredible it was to worship with like 35 or 40,000 other people and my mind was blown realizing the kingdom is so much bigger than what I know and how I felt God's presence in Atlanta I think about the the moment being in the delivery room and seeing my daughters born into the world and God bringing life and thinking you know what wow there's definitely a God because I've seen how God does something incredible and amazing bringing life into the world and it's precious and it's holy and it's good and there is definitely a God. I think about times 15 years in professional ministry walking with people in the ups and downs of life and knowing you know what, there is something greater than what we see. God truly is real. 
And you know what? Here's the thing. When we sense God's presence like that, we can't help but want to share it, right? Jesus called this witness or witnessing in this text in Acts today. He says, you know what? You have seen God present in the world over the course of the last three years. And you've seen it in me. You've seen it in the healings and the teachings and the miracles and the breaking of the bread in death and resurrection. You have seen God. You have been to the mountaintop. Now go and share those things. Mirror the way that I lived to the world. Go take it to back to, to Jerusalem, just 40 minutes up the road. Go take it to Judea. Go take it to a place where they don't want to hear it in Samaria. Go take it to places where you have not yet set foot in India and in Italy and in Eastern, uh, or Eastern uh, Africa. Take this word, this witness to these people that need it. Show them what it means to be my follower. When I have those God moments, I can't help but share those with people. I'm not sure what your default mode is, but we talk about like God moments. When uh, the worship team meets, we talk about where are we seeing God working. In our growth groups, we talk about, uh, you know, where have you seen God present in your life? I know circles do it. I have no doubt you've had opportunities to share where you've seen God present before. I wonder what those mile markers are for you, where you've been to the mountaintop. Where have you seen God present in your life? Where has there been no doubt that God is walking with you? I actually want you to share that this week. You know, this is one of those weeks where, like, whomever's preaching writes the homework for the, for the growth groups, right? And uh, in most of the time when I'm writing, I'm struggling through it. This is the week, of course, since we don't have homework, I would have had like a thousand questions. It would have been like eight pages of homework for growth groups this week because there's so much to work with in this text. But what I would want groups, people, individuals to talk about more than anything else, where have you seen God's presence no doubt, where have you seen God's presence in your life? But you know what? There's another question that goes along with that. And it's the flip side of the coin. And it's part of our human experience. And it's this. Where have I felt the absence of God? Where have I felt emptiness? A distance from God? Because I think that's part of our human experience as well. If we say that we don't have it to ourselves, I think we're being dishonest with ourselves. If we say that to our friends, I think we're being disingenuous. Because this is part of our faith life. It's not only the mountaintop experiences, these moments of, I am sure that God is there. Back down the hill to the... I don't know if I can believe in a God who takes my child or that leaves me alone poor, sick, desperate is this not part of our human experience? and here's my encouragement to you that we can't be afraid to share these moments of holy absence with each other because this is part of our walk too. As much as those mountaintop experiences carry us through everything else, there's just as much valley in our life, in the shadows, in the darkness. Jesus' disciples had those moments too. The people closest to him had moments of doubt and fear, trembling, the feeling of alone. Can we share those things with each other? So that's your homework for this week. Since there's not growth groups this week, that's your homework. Is to be vulnerable with each other, whether you talk about it at, at lunch today, or at dinner tonight, or with a, a close friend, or a co-worker, or your spouse, whomever it might be. Talk about those milestones. Where have you seen God present? 
What are those mountaintop experiences? Talk about what those valleys have been in your life. Face them. Because it's just part of the story. I hope that you're easily reminded of those moments of mountaintop experience. Of feeling God's presence so strong that it almost feels like physically that God is present inside you. I have felt it. It's incredible. I hope, I pray that you have those moments. I hope in those times of valley of darkness, of feeling alone, that those moments of God's presence carry you through. Listen, most of our time is not at the mountaintop. If you've been climbing before, you know, you go up the mountain, you see it, you take it in, and then it's right back down the hill to the next valley, and then the next mountaintop, and the next valley, and the next mountaintop. This is our journey of faith. May you be amazed witnesses. May you feel the presence of God. And when you don't, know that that next mountaintop is just up the corner. God is present. Amen.